uh, from this end, we shall hear no, the welcome remarks of our Dean, Dr. Laverne de la Peña. Dean? Hello, hello. Thank you, Dr. Moiko. A pleasant day to everyone, wherever you're coming from. We're glad that you can join us safely, and we're glad we're able to do this. We'd like to welcome you to the UP College of Music. How good it, have, it might have been if we could see each other face to face. But we are hoping we will be able to do that pretty soon. In any case, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to expand our reach and to have you uh, join us today, uh, including our distinguished speaker. Um, I see some familiar faces uh, in, in the crowd. Uh, Dean Lennett Mirano is here. Hi, Mom Lennett. And of course, our former teacher, Dr. Ronald Walcott is here. I'm sorry we, he cannot talk uh, through his mic, but welcome, Dr. Ron Walcott. He was uh, in a graduate program uh, faculty. When was that? Around the, the 90s, I suppose, late 80s or early 90s. And so it's very, uh, I, I'm very glad to see you here join us. Um, let me just uh, continue on by uh, <clears throat> inviting you to join us in upcoming events. Um, on Saturday would be the fourth installment of the Asia Pacific Society for Ethnomusicology online conference, which the College of Music, along with the UP Center for Ethnomusicology, is hosting and on Saturday, November 27, that's starting at 1.30, we have two panels, but before that, the keynote lecture by none other than the, the, um, the famous composer, Chinari Ung. So please come and see that. The whole um, session uh, for that day will be dedicated to creation. Again, that's the Asia Pacific Society for Ethnomusicology Online Conference. Um, you can register uh, for uh, one day attendance if you haven't done so. Um, and it's for, for people from UP, for students from UP, uh, the registration is free. So take that opportunity, please. Um, pr probably Dr. Moiko will announce this later, but let me uh, beat her to it. <laughs> the Sadik Sik Musika is an international conference to be held next year, February, but the call for entries is ongoing and the deadline for that is November 30, 2021. This is the Graduate Programs International Online Conference of the UP College of Music, Salik Sik Musica. Please tell your friends about it. And finally, um, November 26 uh, will be uh, premiering the University of the Philippines Symphony Orchestra, or UPSO. As you know, UPSO has been very active in spite of the lockdown, probably uh, one of the few uh, performing groups in the country that has remained, uh, that has performed consistently. But on November 26, uh, that will be on Friday, they will be performing a concert titled Remembrances. And this is in commemoration of the centennial death anniversary of Camille Sanson. They will be performing uh, his Requiem, Opus 54, Mesa, Mesa de Requiem by Camille Sanson. And it's also a way of remembering uh, all the loved ones and the people that we have lost during this very dark time. So that's on um, Friday, November 26 at 7 p.m. Manila time. Again, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, and I hope I know that it's going to be a fruitful um, morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Dean. Uh, now to give an introduction about our master class speaker, let's hear from uh, Dr. Patricia Silvestre, the chairperson of the Musicology Department, also my co-host for today. Dr. Pat. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Christine. Thank you, Dr. Vern. Good evening. Good morning, everyone, and good day or good evening to our virtual audience. It's a pleasure and it's wonderful, as Dean Vern has said earlier, for us to get together again for this second in a series of two master classes that we are having on research and critique. 
Um, but uh, before I introduce our speaker for this morning, here are again a few reminders. Uh, we encourage our participants to, to uh, share their thoughts, their uh, comments, their questions. Um, please uh, raise your virtual hands and we will call on you. Uh, but if you opt to chat and uh, type your questions or comments on the chat box, um, Christine and I are here to get to make sure that your uh, thoughts and questions get to our speaker. Uh, it is a privilege indeed to have uh, Dr. Mary Talusan with us this morning. Her talk is titled Listening Beyond the Notes, Reclaiming Filipino Identity in the Performances of the Philippine Constabulary Band During U.S. Colonization. Mary Talusan Lakanlale is an assistant professor of Asian Pacific Studies at California State University, Dominguez Hills. She has a PhD in ethnomusicology from the University of California, Los Angeles, and specializes in Filipino and Filipino American music. Her book, Instruments of Empire, Filipino Musicians, Black Soldiers, and Military Band Music During U.S. Colonization of the Philippines, published in 2021 by the University Press, was was published in 2021 by the University Press of Mississippi. She performs music and dance of the Southern Philippines with the Pakaragian Kulintang Ensemble. Let's all uh, put our virtual hands together and send Mary a warm round of applause. Mary Talusan. Thank you so much, Professor Silvestre, for that introduction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moiko, for inviting me, and thank you, uh, Dean De La Pena, for, uh, for hosting me today. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, present uh, my work, uh, my book, um, to this particular audience because I've been so well connected with UP College of Music over the years, and it has really shaped me as a scholar. And I'm also really interested to hear your feedback on my book. So let me uh, start sharing my screen and um, uh, give you a look into uh, the book that I just recently published. Um, so, you know, today I, I'd really like to focus on one aspect of the book, which is how um, I was able to come to some of the interpretations. Um, that I did um, when I began listening deeply to the music of the Philippine Constabulary Band. Uh, of course, they performed uh, during uh, the early 20th century, and they actually left very few recordings um, that what we call the pre-war band. So I'm um, looking at the Philippine Constabulary Band up until uh, World War II. And again, they left um, very few recordings. And so what I was left with was newspaper accounts of their performances. Um, and I will specifically focus on the ones in the United States because I think they bring to light how American audiences were listening to Filipinos. And I think that the traces, the remnants of those particular ways of hearing Filipinos has actually um, continued uh, to this very day, um, some certain aspects of it. So first, um, oh, yes, my connection to UP. I was really fortunate um, to um, whoops, uh, uh, come to UP uh, starting in the early, uh, late 1990s. Um, and I was able to um, really was really influenced by some of the great leaders of our um, generation in ethnomusicology and music research. And then in 2013, I came back again and um, uh, uh, the UP Symphonic Band was generous enough to perform the works of my great grandfather, um, Captain Pedro Navarro, who um, was part of the Philippine Constabulary Band during the period that I'm looking at. So my book is actually really personal to me. Um, my grandmother um, 
would visit me in Massachusetts. I grew up in, uh, in uh, the suburbs of Boston, Massachusetts. And, you know, I really didn't have a lot of connection to um, Filipino culture. And so when my grandmother would visit me every couple of years from the Philippines, she told me this fantastic story about how her father was a famous uh, band musician and band conductor. And he toured the United States several times with uh, the Philippine Constabulary Band. So I've been hearing these stories my whole life. And it really wasn't until I went to graduate school that um, I tried to understand their context in a much bigger way. Um, and particularly what US colonization had to do with the way in which Filipinos came to be represented in the United States, specifically through musical performance. Um, so this is what I'm gonna uh, focus my talk on today. One of the things that I discussed in my book was how American audiences developed what I called hearing with an imperial ear. Uh, the Philippine Constabulary Band, just to give you a brief history, um, was founded in 1902 by um, Lieutenant, at the time, uh, Walter H. Loving, who was an African-American soldier. He came to the Philippines as part of the uh, 48th Regiment and really made an impression on not only Filipinos, but also Americans that were living in the Philippines with his amazing musical talent, especially for conducting um, ensembles. He conducted a men's chorus um, of African-American singers. I think there were 400 of them. And then he was asked by um, Governor General Taft to found a a band, a colonial military band, that would sort of perform the role similar to the U.S. Marine Band. So they would perform in official functions of the colonial state. Um, and, um, and they were sent to the United States four times in 1904 for the infamous St. Louis World's Fair. And then they came back again in 1909 to match, uh, March in um, President Taft's um, inauguration. They came back again in 1915 and participated in the uh, um, San Francisco, Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco. And then one last time before World War II in 1939, they became the Philippine Army Band and uh, returned to San Francisco to perform at the Golden Gate Exposition. So a lot of my research um, into different archives was um, I found a lot of American newspapers that wrote about their performances in the United States. And what I noticed was they were positive. They were glowing uh, reviews of the military band's performances. They were um, very favorable as far as the uh, musicianship of the Filipino band musicians, and they also complimented uh, Colonel Loving. So what I wanted to understand though, because I had some questions, um, for example, while they were complimentary, at the same time, they always used the moniker Little Brown Men, Little Brown Men performing um, European and, and Western band music repertoire. And this, this troubled me somehow because um, Little Brown Men is definitely a racialized way of portraying Filipinos. Um, perhaps, yes, they were uh, shorter in stature than the average American. Um, so perhaps, um, you know, in objective ways, you could argue that um, these were just descriptors. But I argue they're not just descriptors. They're ways of racializing Filipinos around musical performance in which they subjected Filipinos to what Stuart Hall calls ritual degradation. So while at the same time they um, were positive about their musicianship, um, they also tended to diminish um, Filipinos' capabilities by not only calling them little brown men, 
but also saying that they were natural musicians. And I know that you know uh, that we still hear um, about uh, this word today, you know, Filipinos are such good singers, Filipinos are natural born performers, and in a way that sounds really, you know, complimentary, something we might want to embrace in a world where there are um, perhaps not as many compliments um, about the Philippines or Filipinos. But I argue though, this comes with a price to pay. Um, and that price to pay is that our um, identity and our artistry and our um, autonomy as um, independent human beings become sacrificed at the hands of being called natural musicians. So, you know, we can find records in way back during Spanish colonization that um, talks about how Filipinos are, you know, very naturally musical. We as Filipinos know that it is definitely ingrained in our culture um, from an early age in social situations um, where music is part of an everyday life. However, I argue that when this um, is, uh, is articulated in the context of U.S. race relations and racism and racial hi hierarchy, this takes on a different meaning. Uh, this becomes um, a way to erase Filipino identity from our music making. So I hope if you do have the chance to read the book, um, you can uh, delve a little bit more into, um, into my, uh, the ways that I analyze this particular way of representing Filipinos. Um, so this is my great grandfather, my mother's mother's father, Captain uh, Pedro Navarro. He was actually the first Filipino conductor of the Philippine Constabulary Band. In 1916, when uh, um, Walter H. Loving, Lieutenant Loving, uh, retired from the PC band for the first time. He retired a few times, but when he retired for the first time, he handed my great grandfather the baton. And this took place uh, at the Luneta um, on the bandstand. They were playing um, Odd Lang Syme and the, at, in the middle of the piece, uh, Lieutenant Loving gave the baton to uh, my great grandfather, Pedro Navarro, and the band kept playing, of course. And um, so uh, Navarro put down his piccolo and uh, began to conduct the band. So this was very symbolic of the handing over of the leadership of the Philippine Constabulary Band to Navarro. Um, well, after that, uh, Loving takes um, quite a bit of time. He returns to the United States, but he does come back in 1938 to once again um, lead the band, and he would eventually take them to uh, the Golden Gate Exposition in 1939. So um, the main arguments of my book are that the Philippine Constabulary Band, um, during the times in which they came to the U.S., uh, was represented in the American news media in ways that serve the propagandistic aims of the U.S. administration. The um, colonization of the Philippines was quite a debate within the United States. In fact, many Americans were against it. And especially in, at the 1904 World's Fair, there was really a need to legitimize the takeover of the Philippines um, by the United States. And in fact, the constabulary ban becomes one of the ways that um, the United States um, uh, legitimizes their colonization because they notoriously juxtapose the Philippine constabulary band musicians with the tribal people. And in doing so, we're making the argument that, look, we trained Filipinos uh, we somewhat civilized them so that in just a few short years, they're able to play um, European opera overtures and Sousa military marches. Um, as Filipinos, we know that's not true. We know we have a long history of European music in the Philippines. Um, like, for example, my great grandfather trained from a, a very early age um, in <clears throat> not only um, piccolo and flute, but also violin. He was 
a conductor, a composer. He knew music theory very well. Well, this was hidden from the American public by newspapers um, because they said that Lieutenant Loving chose <clears throat> uh, these musicians at random. He randomly chose a bunch of Filipinos and in just a few short years, was able to train them somehow into being one of the finest bands at the 1904 World's Fair. We know this because we have there are quotes, documentation that John Philip Sousa himself said that the Philippine Constabulary Band was one of the finest bands at the fair. So yes, in one way, um, the American news media tried to portray Filipinos uh, in a certain light that um, served to uphold um, their takeover of the Philippines. For some though, like John Philip Sousa, he was able to hear the band uh, live and he would have had questions about these claims that American newspapers were making because uh, if you're a musician, you know that it takes many years of training to achieve a certain level of uh, musicianship. Well, the American public did not know this. And so, um, overwhelmingly the message was that the United States civilized Filipinos and here's the proof of it, this military band that could play amazing um, uh, performances of, of European music specifically. Um, so how, you know, how do I hear Filipino authenticity, Filipino identity, Filipino music making? Um, when they're playing um, Sousa marches and you know Rossini's opera overtures and the like. Well, I had to really take a leap of interpretation. And of course I used the work of uh, uh, scholars like um, you know, William Scott, Cracks in the Parchment Curtain, uh, James C. Scott, um, Weapons of the Week, um, Domination in the Arts of Resistance, and um, more recently, John Cruz's idea of ethnosympathy. Uh, how do we understand um, the way that the way we listen to and hear the music of so-called others is really shaped by the lens that we've developed? And overwhelmingly in the early 20th century, that lens was uh, um, cultural evolution, white superiority, and the superiority of the United States in being able and capable to civilize um, so-called savages. Uh, that's the term that was used at the 1904 fair in just a few short miraculous years. So I think we have to listen differently to the performances of the Philippine Constabulary Band. Um, and so the cultural effects of media representation and the racialization of Filipinos through music, I believe still resonates today when I um, hear what's being said about Filipinos. And again, they tend to be positive. Filipinos are great singers, et cetera, et cetera. But there is you know, a downside to this, a very subtle, racialized way of continuing to hear Filipino performers. And so um, the role of US colonization, I mean, American newspapers were very influential and rarely did they have to um, you know, show proof of what they were saying, uh, that they were able to hide the fact that these musicians came from generations of uh, band musicians in the Philippines. Um, was quite a feat and quite powerful. Um, and so it's a persistent idea that has come to shape the ways that American audiences, I believe, still hear Filipinos to this day. And so again, um, you know, John, uh, sorry, the Philippine Constabulary Band at the 1904 World's Fair, I noticed by going through the hundreds, maybe thousands of programs from the fair, that the uh, Philippine Constabulary Band played Sousa's Stars and Stripes Forever more than any out, out of any band at the fair, American, European, and uh, one band from Mexico. Um, they played it the most. And how I interpret that is that there really was um, an impetus for the US co colonial administration to emphasize that 
Filipinos were indeed willing participants in the colonial project. And a lot of the audiences at the fair, um, these are from diaries and some newspapers, were thrilled that the uh, Filipino band musicians seemed to be so enthusiastic about playing um, Sousa's March. And therefore, it was taken for an expression of the willingness to participate in American patriotism. Um, this becomes even more um, crucial to understand because suddenly the Philippines' uh, long history of playing uh, European music from Spanish colonial times starts to become erased. And newspapers would say things like, well, they're so good at Western music because they have no native music. They have uh, no music that they you know, play for themselves. And um, I really credit um, uh, Walter Loving, the conductor, because he endeavored to include the compositions of Filipino musicians um, in their programs. Uh, sometimes this would just be one piece, uh, La Sampaguita or La Belle of the Philippines were, were two popular ones, but he did make an effort. And in one concert during the 1904 World's Fair, he actually, uh, they actually performed an entire program of uh, Philippine um, compositions. Um, and so, you know, at the 1904 fair, music was really used as proof of um, civilization. The uh, groups that could play so-called civilized music, um, and of course this whole structure was created, this whole hierarchy was created by, um, you know, uh, American um, and other socio-cultural um, evolutionists uh, to show the level of a, a civilization or a culture's level of civilization through music. And so you can imagine, and, and perhaps you've already read about how um, the native peoples of the Philippines were portrayed during the 1904 World's Fair. Uh, they said that um, the uh, tribal people like um, the Bontoks, the, um, Ha, you know, we're making noise, we're making chaotic no, noise. And therefore the Philippine Constabulary Band was put on the opposite end of the spectrum to show that American tutelage could indeed take us from chaotic noise to more civilized forms of expression in music. Um, I assumed or that you've read um, Francis Densmore's study of Filipinos at the World's Fair. Um, and if you read it, it, she really struggles with trying to understand the music of say the, um, for example, the Kulintangan Ensemble by the, um, the Sama uh, Baja musicians. Uh, she called it, you know, cheerful chaos because she couldn't make sense of, you know, the polyrhythms um, and the intricate interactions uh, between the musicians and of course the improvisatory nature of the music. Um, for her, uh, civilized music was really performing the scores of what, what is Western music. And so you could see how the way that she was, the lens through which she saw people informed her listening practices. This it was in no way objective. And um, so she um, uh, put all of the different tribal groups in a hierarchy. And interestingly enough, she doesn't mention the Philippine Constabulary Band until the very end of her article, um, which states that, um, well, listening to the Philippine Constabulary Band shows that at some point indigenous music of the Philippines or what you called native music of the Philippines will be gone forever under the stars and stripes. Um, so while I credit her with trying to preserve um, Philippine indigenous music, she definitely only focuses on those to make a case for what Philippine music is. So to her, and we can argue even uh, ethnomusicologists after her, 
playing Western music is not a expression of one's authentic musical culture um, because ethnomusicology has tended to in the past been focused on indigenous music as the sort of quote unquote true form of a culture's music. However, I, and I'm sure you too, would like to disagree with that and discuss the ways in which that music isn't just about the genre, but is also the way that the musicians themselves, the audience um, conceptualize the music and think about, think about what they're doing. Uh, oops. Um, so I said this already. Um, so as I said, there were many, many newspapers that um, that really um, were thrilled about the, the level of artistry um, that Filipino musicians of the constabulary band had in playing <clears throat> Western music, <clears throat> pardon me. However, they at some points also doubted that they were really playing music. Um, and this is largely because I think um, that uh, there was one particular incident at the 1904 World's Fair. Um, sorry, I'm kind of going out of order here, in which the Filipino uh, musicians kept playing after a power outage um, turned off all the lights at the on the fairgrounds. You know, I can't find the exact. Um, newspaper account of this particular concert, but it is a legend I've been hearing for many decades, not only by my grandmother, but many other musicians that know uh, about the Philippine Constabulary Band. And I really wanted to do a deeper dive into how do I analyze this? They kept playing after the lights were turned off. And so that must mean that they, um, were such fine musicians that they had all of this music memorized. So that was my initial thinking. But as I read about what American audiences, the ways that they doubted Filipinos um, because of this, I realized that not everyone has the same idea about what a thing means. And so for American audiences at the time, to, that, to them, being able to play without music, without written score could possibly call into question whether they were playing at all or simply mimicking playing um, music. And so uh, actually, let me play this slide for you first to give you just what a picture, uh, a picture of what it might have been like at this concert. Okay, um, you know, and so it was quite, you know, miraculous and quite um, impressive that the Philippine Constabulary Band could play um, through the dark and finish their concert. In fact, on the, the night of this tornado in St. Louis in 1904, uh, there are newspaper accounts that other bands had to stop playing because they could not go on without the music. Um, and so this was, you know, an a legendary um, moment. But what I have come to realize is that American audiences saw it one way and Filipinos saw it a different way. For Filipinos, this demonstrated our musicianship, our artistry, our deep knowledge of the music that we can play without score. But for American audiences, they questioned, well, maybe Filipinos can't really read music. In fact, maybe they're just mimicking music and uh, playing it from memory. Um, I'm sure you're already familiar with the banda tradition in the Philippines and that uh, there are these competitions 
um, that um, are called um, bangaan and later on develop into a tambakan or a duel of bands. And one of the rules of this competition is that you cannot play with the score. You have to play by memory. And so for us, this, or the band musicians themselves, this is an expression of their no, deep knowledge of music, their artistry, and actually even their masculine prowess, because sometimes these tambakan would last for days. In fact, in 1924, um, in an American newspaper, they reported on one of these tambakan and said that the Philippine constabulary had to be called in to stop this competition, which had been going on for three days. Um, and so uh, they, these two bands would battle each other until one of them was exhausted and sort of fell to the wayside. Um, again, American audiences uh, interpreted this differently. In fact, they subjected the Philippine Constabulary Band to uh, test compositions to prove that they could actually read music um, by uh, making them, you know, sight read uh, pieces, which they did very well. This happened, um, for example, at Boston Symphony Hall. Boston, of course, is where I grew up, so it was exciting to hear that my great grandfather was uh, had actually been there. Uh, Oh, sorry, here is the photograph of that. Uh, my great grandfather is here. This was in 1909. So what did this, um, you know, to talk about uh, analysis and interpretation, what did this mean to me? Uh, to me, I think that uh, this calls into question not Filipinos musicianship, but really the leadership and the tutelage of American rule, um, because how useful was it um, and necessary was it to have a conductor when the band musicians could play it on their own, for example. Um, and to me, this was a continuation of the Philippine banda tradition in America. Now, whether they were playing Sousa or whether they were playing the music of a Filipino composer, they were still continuing the banda tradition in the United States. It's just that we can't hear it per se because it's not in the musical genre. Um, but to me, this demonstrates that they were indeed continuing their traditional indigenous mode of playing. And so this brings me back to, you know, um, uh, Scott's analysis of hidden transcripts or um, William Scott's reading against the grain of these newspapers to really try to uncover the distinctiveness of Filipino performance, even though they're playing um, genres of Western uh, military band music. Um, also, um, just to address the idea of mimicry um, briefly, because this is could be a very, very long conversation, but there was one um, particular incident in which Sousa conducted the Philippine Constabulary Band at the uh, 1915 World's Fair. And he said, quote, when I close my eyes, I thought it was the US Marine Band playing. And for um, Sousa, perhaps it was a tribute to the US Marine Band and that the Filipinos um, were so enamored of, um, you know, one of the best bands in the world that they were willing to mimic their style. However, I'd like to read this against the grain because um, the Philippine Constabulary Band didn't play in that style all the time. In fact, they played um, in their own style, but they could also uh, imitate the, the style of other bands. And for me, this, um, and I draw on Stephanie Ning's work on Filipino cover bands, to again, read against the grain of this and look at the process rather than the genre. I think that imitation um, is one of the ways in which um, Filipinos can perform, but it is not the only way. And so, uh, however, because of the imperial ear, um, American audiences are rarely ever to see this. Um, for example, Sarita C um, says that, quote, um, 
American empire constitutively forgets that it is an empire. It offers neither space nor speech for the exploration of its post-colonial cultures. And in this way, um, quote, it's nearly impossible for, for Filipino America to articulate its history of multiple co colonialisms and racial, racial subjugation, um, end quote, which often leads to misunderstandings Filipinos engagement with American culture. Um, for Filipinos, it is one of the many different forms of expression, but it, it hardly is the only form of expression. So I, I take a deeper dive into what I think are the ways in which in their limited resistance, the Filipino band musicians express their identities. For example, I found um, um, two newspaper accounts in which the band uh, during their performance laid down what I called their instruments of empire, the brass instruments, um, and also the band itself was functioning as an instrument of empire. But they, the Filipino musicians, put down their instruments and sang in their own voices. Um, in fact, uh, one newspaper said, quote, one of the attractive departures of, in last night's program was several songs sung in the native Filipino tongue, demonstrating that the little brown men can sing as well as play. And for while the reporter heard it that way, I hear it a different way. Why did they put down their instruments? Uh, they were experts at band instruments. And later on, they also played as an orchestra, but they sang. Um, and I think, you know, sure, they were probably very good singers. They could hold a tune, but it wasn't their expertise. So why did they do this? Um, to me, I feel like they were expressing themselves, whether it was spontaneous or deliberate, but in the spur of the moment, they sang their native songs in their native tongue. We don't know what songs they were, however, and with the perhaps imperfect timbres of their own voices. They had been on the road for a year um, in the United States. Uh, three of the band's men sadly passed away. One of them was very young. And for me, uh, putting myself in their shoes, um, it just had a greater emotional force, perhaps expressing sadness, nostalgia, longing for home, and longing to be seen um, in ways that they weren't seen. They had no control over how American newspapers were portraying them. Uh, American audiences were demanding perfection every night. And so I believe this was a moment of transgression in which they laid their instruments aside and sang in their own voices to express their own identity. Um, so I think in these ways, I hoped in a few different examples, I was able to sort of um, what I call dismember the imperial ear and um, listen to Filipino authenticity against the grain of what American newspapers um, were telling me about the performances of the Filipino bandsmen. So I'd like to um, end this portion of my presentation with one of the few um, recordings of the Philippine Constabulary Band at that time. This is a 1910 Edison Cylinder recording of La Sampaguita by Ruiz, and it is uh, available on, online um, through U UC Santa Barbara's website. Okay, and if you'd like to check out my other work, um, uh, my colleagues and I uh, co-edited a book called Our Culture Resounds, Our Future Reveals, A Legacy of Filipino-American Performing Arts in California. It is actually free and you can download it. Um, it has live links, which will take you to video, 
audio and photographs um, that are um, discussed in the book. And also Kulintang Cultura, I co-produced this with um, Theo Gonzalez and um, wonderful performers like Dr. Bernard Elurin and his student Kim Kalanduyan is on this as well, as well as uh, Danny Kalanduyan's um, Kuling Tong music performances, but also the second CD has Filipino Americans who've incorporated uh, Kuling Tong into genres like hip hop um, and uh, world music and also hard rock. So um, please look out for that. Maraming salamat po. Um, thank you so much. I will take your questions um, during the Q&A, but for right now, I would like to shift um, to discussing um, the paper of um, Mr. Nico um, Vitug. And I was wondering if you could please give a brief introduction to your paper and I will give my comments. Hello, Dr. Talusan. Uh, firstly, I, I, I'm okay. Kayo po, kumusta? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your ano, for your presentation. I'm very eager to to actually read your work because also I, I had the chance to work in a music context in the US within a film and community. So I, I think a lot of that is although it's a church context as well, no? Um and uh before I begin, I, I just like to preface this this uh, talk that there seems to be a very interesting interesting intersections for me one of the people in the uh attendees lists is a is a teacher of mine from the Ateneo de Manila grade school who taught me the music of Contiveros uh, as part of our liturgical music celebrations um my paper uh which i presented for a workshopping and with Dr. Talusan has to do with um how this music of Father Eduardo Contiveros SJ the late Honti uh, was perceived to have been, uh, you know, Spanish in influence by, by influential musicians such as uh, Manuel Maramba, OSB, who was also a part-time faculty of the UP College of Music at one point. Uh, when, when Father uh, Maramba made that assessment, that, that assessment is still online, uh, he was also uh, telling that uh, he had borrowed some of the chants recorded by national artist Jose Maceda in coming up with uh, liturgical music, uh, I think particularly for his own Benedictine context. Now, uh, and uh, the thing is, uh, there is this notion that Maramba's music, uh, that Contiveros' music is, um, is actually Spanish and therefore not Filipino enough. But then again, I, I think that what I'd like to explore is how this is actually Filipino and partly uh, what, what happens is that uh, in the context when Father Hontiveros was composing his music, of course, there were, there were discourses on nationalism and music, uh, particularly familiar to the UP College of Music context, I think, are the debates between people, the, the, the legends like uh, Francisco Santiago and Nicanor Abelardo about what na how nationalism should be uh, played out. But at the same time, there are figures like... Uh, uh, more recently, the former dean of the College of Music, uh, yes, the first dean, in fact, uh, Ramon Tapales, who, who said that, uh, you know, why are we problematizing nationalism in this particular sense? No? Parang, wh why do we have to uh, make artificial appearances, like, uh, you know, artificial bahay kubos, in order to come up with such music that could be called nationalist? And this would be, I suppose, diametrically opposed to ideas from national artist uh, Lucio San Pedro, who really pointed out that in particular pieces of his music, there are particular things that point towards Filipino culture. Um, aside from this thing happening around the music of Father Hontiveros, uh, there were also other factors, like he was a, formate, he was a Jesuit formator, and he was, um, he was a, uh, I think, a psychology, a psychology expert, so therefore, he was also keen on how people were feeling and what what is accessible to people. Uh, aside from that, uh, the Jesuits were also associated with, uh, uh, you know, they, they also had to uh, somehow, you know, relate with the Marcoses. Uh, if I remember right, I don't think I put this in my paper, but uh, the the Jesuits, uh, the the Philip the 
Rizal Library of the Ateneo de Manila was something that was uh, uh, funded by, I think, but also, also supported by Imelda Marcos. So there were these kinds of connections that have to be explored. Uh, so uh, I, I think I touched on some of the major things surrounding uh, the composition by Father Hontiveros, SJ, of liturgical music. And I would like to problematize the idea that, you know, some people think it's Filipino, some people think it's not. And uh, more importantly, uh, I, well, personally, my, 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 my inclination is that it, it, there is something about it that's, that can be said to be Filipino. So it, this actually surprisingly intersects with your research, ma'am, because it, it has to do with identification. It has to do with identity. And uh, I think it's particularly, uh, well, uh, let me end on a personal note. As I've said, I, I grew up as a little boy in the Ateneo grade school where we used to sing these songs. So th this also, this research also has some personal connection to me. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, um, Nico, for sending me this paper. I was really um, happy to read it because like you said, we had quite, uh, I think we grappled with some of the similar issues. And, um, you know, I think that what constitutes national identity and cultural identity really shifts over time, like you um, excavated in your paper, um, that what might be called national today might not be tomorrow. Um, I am reminded that the uh, program of all Filipino composers in 1904 that the Philippine Constabulary Band played were largely those that were very Spanish influenced. But this um, for US audiences at the time um, somewhat signaled to Americans that, uh, that, the, that Filipinos had been so um, Hispanicized um, that the only way they could express themselves was through kind of a, a Spanish influenced music. Um, and, you know, for American audiences, I believe they um, would have taken this for uh, the sort of quote unquote civilized culture of the Philippines, these particular um, compositions that were heavily Spanish influenced, because at the time that's, that's what the musical influences were. Um, and so, yes, I think that, you know, what we consider national uh, changes over time, and it's a difficult issue to resolve, um, especially through the music, the use of musical genre, um, and also what you uh, talked about, perhaps the um, artificial sort of um, insertion of um, you know, Baha'i Kubo in the melody and so on and so forth. Um, and so, you know, just to point to different um, elements of Filipino identity. However, for me, I think the way I had to get around this was to listen beyond the notes and to really hear the Philippine constabulary band, not through the genres they were playing, but through how they were playing and the ways in which they thought they were playing. I believe in their own minds, they were playing the Philippine banda tradition. They might have seemed enthusiastic about playing Stars and Stripes by Sousa. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that they were embracing American patriotism. For me, they were showing that they were capable of playing with artistry, different genres of music, which would have connected to their sense of being master musicians, right? Not mimics, but master musicians who can play multiple genres, uh, multiple instruments as well. And uh, for me, um, continuing their own tradition, even in the United States. So, you know, um, I think this is a big issue that is difficult to resolve. Um, and it will change over time the ways that we can see, conceive about it, conceive um, what nationalism and cultural identity mean. I kind of want to shift, though, to some things that I found extremely intriguing about your paper. Um, for example, you started off uh, your paper with a quote 
um, by Pope Francis, in which he says, and I think, I believe the title of the article is Smugglers of Faith. Um, and the, I think the context for this, as you put in your paper, was that Filipino migrants um, who especially work in countries um, in the Middle East, which are not predominantly Christian, of course, have to so-called smother, smuggle their faith um, into places. Actually, if I would you mind if I shared the actual document that I'm reading? Um, no, not please do. Uh, please okay, do. thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so you know, I and I'll send you a copy of this um, after after the presentation. But the smugglers of faith, I mean, it, it really just intrigued me to no end because I actually saw this theme of smuggling uh, within other aspects of your paper. So. Could this be a metaphor, for example, um, for other parts of your paper? I think um, I need. I, it is very interesting um, what you say about the liturgical music of Hontiveros and you know the discourse around it. But I think for me, I was extremely intrigued by um, the ways uh, that Filipino migrants abroad bring their uh, liturgical music with them as either an expression of faith, but also other things you pointed out, which are loneliness, um, nostalgia, being away for, from their families. Um, so this might have even more of a connection uh, to why they uh, perform and sing this music, um, uh, regardless of its sort of uh, national or cultural identity as specifically Filipino. Um, so, um, uh, and I think you say as much, you know, you said that one might see something in our Catholic liturgical music that is markedly Filipino, which could be argued are the ways in which we think about this music and which may serve more than matters of faith. So uh, again, uh, homesickness for the Philippines, uh, loneliness uh, for um, uh, to have people around you that are like you from your culture, and of course, uh, nostalgia for our traditions back home. Um, so you also talk about, um, uh, you know, uh, liturgical music that's been influenced by the Spanish. It's very important that we problematize this um, and, and perhaps try to figure out what might be identifiably Filipino in this. Well, will it be in the musical analysis? Will it be in the lyrical analysis? Or can there be something broader, such as why and how Filipinos use music, especially in the context of uh, their journeys abroad, which you know could be a couple of years or more, um, so I just was very um, intrigued by um, this idea of smuggling. And I think you know, what if, what if in the work um, of Hontiveros, there, you you talk about that he used some chants and other. Um, parts of compositions by uh, other, uh, by Spanish composers, what if this is also a form of smuggling uh, and why? I'm not sure of the answer, but is smuggling a theme um, or a, a way that Filipinos have to insert their cultural identity, especially under colonial domination, economic domination from the countries that, um, uh, to which they are migrants. Um, and so perhaps smuggling and inserting Filipino identity into um, what some people consider universal, you know, liturgical music might be the thing that is Filipino. I, I don't know. That's just a question that I have. Um, so um, yeah, I guess, you know, it's, uh, I think those are sort of my biggest um, uh, suggestions or comments about, about your paper. Um, and I, I'm really hope, hoping that you might uh, look more into this idea of smuggling and to also why and how 
Filipino migrants abroad find this particular type of music meaningful. So thank you very much, Nico. Thank you very much, Po. I, I look forward to having a copy of your notes. And uh, yes, thank you. Definitely, definitely. Okay, thank you. Uh, also, uh, Nico. Nico is uh, one of our PhD students. And uh, we, uh, we requested some of our students to actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, give their paper for critiquing. You know, and he's one of the brave souls <laughs> who forwarded. Uh, so he's actually a graduate student. This is a really a good uh, opportunity for you to, uh, to share your paper for critiquing, you know? uh, especially uh, coming from our master class speakers. You know? um, so on this end, uh, so thank you again, Nico. No? Thank you so much. Uh, and also Dr. Lucent for, uh, Dr. Lakhan Lale for uh, giving the critiquing. Since the master class is not only about research, but also about, you know, critic, critiquing um, as, a, as a subject and also as a, a really a way of, of doing, um, doing things or how our graduate students from lear to learn, to learn from research and also how to move forward with the research. Okay, on this end, uh, we welcome back again our, my co-host, uh, Dr. Silvestre, uh, and we can still have a Q&A um, until about 11.20, okay? So I think there's a first question here from uh, Dr. Walcott, Dr. Ron Walcott. Uh, welcome again. A, a lot of people here love to, uh, they actually uh, are very surprised to see you, including Dr. Mirano. Don't <laughs> want to see you here, uh, Dr. Walcott. So his question for you, Dr. Lakhanlare, is that, is there any evidence expressed by the band members themselves, for example, in personal letters, uh, in letters home where they object to being subjected to a site reading test in Boston. Uh, so you can also see that in the chat box, uh, Mary. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I wish there were um, letters home. I wish there were diaries. Um, I've been to the Howard University archives where uh, Colonel Loving's papers were, um, were uh, submitted to the archives. And no, I scoured everything looking for um, uh, you know, their impressions of how they were uh, represented in the United States. In my book, I talk about um, a interview that um, Dr. Um, Richardson, Claiborne T. Richardson, who was an African-American scholar. Sadly, he passed away right before my book came out. Um, but he didn't, he came to the Philippines and did an interview with surviving band members. There were just a handful of them that were there. Um, for some reason, my grand aunt, a daughter of Navarro, was there as well. And unfortunately, you know, they were quite elderly and um, really couldn't express um, some, you know, in terms of some of the questions, he did ask them pointed questions about, um, you know, the way they were treated uh, in the United States. And uh, it seemed like overwhelmingly they were enthusiastic and also very glad that they were able to go to the United States. Um, so I, I didn't find any evidence, unfortunately, uh, to answer your question of, of being subjected to the sight reading test in Boston. I can only imagine though, that it did allow them to prove that they could read music and that they were real musicians in the sense of how American audiences thought about it, which is could they read musical scores? Because the um, Boston Globe um, said that they did very well and that um, they, per, they sight read this uh, piece by a little known composer. So they would have had no access to it. And it was a new piece. They sight read it very well. And I think to the Filipino musicians at that time, they would have been very proud of it um, rather than, um, than uh, object to it. So um, I, I, that's how I would interpret it. Thank you for, so much for that question. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mary. There's another hand being raised. That's from, from Dr. Mirano. Yes, yes, Dr. Mirano, would you like to Good morning, Mary. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here, Dr. Mirano. Yeah. Um, 
my my uh, I don't even know if it's a question, but you but there have been many qu questions that have been asked, and then uh, even in connect. Uh, Many things have been connecting with me, even with regard to the paper about traveling, uh, about about meeting up with other cultures, about intersecting between Filipino musicians and or Filipinos in other cultures and bringing along their culture and music with them. No, so I I'm really thinking about the construct that. I suppose the Americans must have had that, you know, these people who were coming from the Philippines were these primitive people locked up in mountain fastnesses, uh, you know, um, have no having no access to Western civilization, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this was very much mistaken, obviously, no, because if you will do the work, if you will do the research, you will really know that Filipinos are travelers even the very early Filipinos, those who were not even Filipinos, but those Austronesians traveling from Taiwan all the way to through the Philippines uh, and all the way to Madagascar, right? They reached Madagascar. And so we are really a traveling people. Now this, this, was very, this is always verifiable. First, in the sense of the musicians that might have been the band members that that might have gone to the Smithsonian, uh, I'm sorry, to, to the St. Louis Exposition. Mm -hmm. Because if you have looked at the material that has been collected, there's a lot of raw material collected from all kinds of uh, periodicals by William Summers and uh, by Pat Silvestre, who is here now, and you can ask her about it. There are lists of band members who went to Singapore, who went to who went to Hong Kong, who traveled and no, who participated in the revolution, who played for this band, uh, who paid for, uh, played for this orchestra, for an, or for an opera group that came in from uh, Italy or something like that. And so you have the names of these people. I don't know, might some of them have been members of the constabulary band? Because, you know, Marcelo Adonai was your grandfather's mentor. It's yes. very, very clear he visited him before he went off to, to, uh, no, to um, St. Louis. And so uh, many of his students traveled all over Southeast Asia, all over Asia. They went to the United States. Maybe you will find your answers as to what they felt about traveling from there. No? Yes. And then if you will also look at the records of the... Um, both the St. Louis Exposition and our 1998 Smithsonian Folklife Festival. And if you know the composition of people there, you will know that these Filipinos, okay, they're Kalinga, they're, they're Bukidnon, they're Tiboli, they're, you know, they have been around. Like our, um, you remember, Pat, our, uh, our Tala Andig, uh, the leader of the dances, our, our dance mistress was married to a Kalinga, whom she met yes. because he was a trader. He was um he was a traveling salesman. No? Our um our Magindanao silk weaver, who was also a madrasa teacher, had lived in uh, Saudi Arabia and she had gone back and forth and back and forth. And then Pat Afable confirmed this. Pat is from the Smithsonian itself, no? And she was the, um, she was the colleague, uh, no, she was the assistant of uh, Harold Conklin. She has papers showing how these people who went to the Smithsonian, uh, to the, to the um, St. Louis Exposition were traveling back and forth from the Cordilleras to the United States, to Europe and back. And so that is a mistake also to think, and we think that way, no? That these people are just locked up. They don't know anything, but in truth, we are a traveling people. And that is probably one of the characteristics of the Austronesian Filipino as a person, no? So that, that's, yes. my, that's my really strong gut feel, no? About the biggest mistake we make. And so to say that we are primitive, uh, when you are in contact with all these civilizations, when you have had your pottery sent to Japan to the imperial family, no? because uh, there is a certain kind of pottery from Ilocos that 
is specially reserved for the imperial family. And this is not, uh, this is about a century or two ago, according to the trade routes, you know. Then you have something, uh, something else to consider rather than this, um, this very parochial kind of thinking about nation, about, uh, about uh, race, about uh, primitive and advanced, no? So maybe we can reframe our, uh, our vision to include that kind of thinking, you know, that uh, we are more sophisticated than we think. And that's my basic <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Morano. Yes, we definitely are more sophisticated than the world has portrayed us. And so uh, I think you're, you know, you're right. I, the first time Filipinos came to what is now the United States was in, you know, 1587 aboard the Spanish galleons. There were communities as early as the 1700s in the United, or what is now Louisiana. And so, yes, Filipinos, Austronesians are, are traveling people, they are very cosmopolitan. The Philippines was cosmopolitan. Um, and I definitely use uh, the works of others like uh, Dr. Maceda's work and um, the newer one um, about colonial counterpoint um, by DMR Irving uh, to show in, in the, my book that um, the Philippines has had this long history of engaging with a cosmopolitan forms of music. Um, I'm glad you brought up the 1998 Smithsonian Festival. I was there and um, I was really, uh, it really was a moment in which um, I saw how Filipinos themselves were um, or portraying and representing themselves to the American public and to kind of um, right the wrongs of the 1904 World Fair, so to speak. Um, and so, yeah, I do hope that um, in, in my book that I have been able to show that um, the way that American audiences want to hear Filipinos, especially at that time, they might have not um, cared for this information that showed that Filipinos are incredibly sophisticated, worldly, and I mean, they ignored the fact that we had a long history of Western music. In fact, when a group of students from universities, the Pensionados, went to the 1904 World's Fair, the average American said, oh, do you like wearing clothes? You know, because that was their conception at the time. So at the time, yes, um, I believe that, you know, that uh, they might not have been interested um, to know that the Philippines had such a rich history. And I'm hoping that I can encourage others to um, interrogate and critique the use of that oft repeated saying that Filipinos are natural musicians. Yes, it's in our culture, but the artists that come over to the United States are trained, they spent thousands of hours learning their craft. It's not because they're Filipino that they're a good singer, but it is because they're an artist. So I, I hope to turn that around um, so that it, it um, stops recirculating these old notions and concepts about the relationship between music and race, particularly in the Filipino context, which has been used to erase our identity. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mary. Uh, I think we will need more time to talk about identity in the way we're going. We, we need to end by 11.30, is that right? Yes. Uh, okay, um, we, have, uh, we have a question here from Dr. Santos. Uh, it's in the chat box. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, you have been introduced to the Kulintang and other indigenous musical traditions, as well as to the band music and the Western music activities in the Philippines. How would you merge these experiences in such a way that we can see what, what Filipino musical identity really is all about or can be identified as truly Filipino and not any other cultural identity? And that's followed up by how would you characterize Filipino identity or musical identity from all the experiences and knowledge that you have gained in your research? 
Thank you so much, Dr. Santos, for that question. And only you can bring all of my you know, different interests and research together because of course you were there for much of it and advising me and um, being such an incredible mentor. And I, I can never really thank you enough for all the ways in which you supported me and went, mentored me through my research. Um, but anyway, yes, this book was not my dissertation. In fact, my dissertation was on um, Maguindanao music. I, I did include Kulintang, which I performed today with um, the group Karagian Kulintang Ensemble, um, but also um, the Dayundai. And I think, you know, by looking at all the different genres of music that um, are, are part of different cultures in the Philippines. Um, I, I mean, I, I would hardly, it would hard be difficult for me to explain what is Filipino identity, but I do see something there in all the different kinds of music that I've listened to, that I've tried to participate in. There are definitely aspects which I feel are just truly Filipinos. And it's not so much like the elements of the music themselves, but really how uh, people in the Philippines um, use music in social ways, in ways to um, highlight the different people in their community. Um, just for example, when I was in Cotabado with um, Guru Danny Kalanduyan, um, everyone would take turns at the Kulintang or at the Gandingan or the Agong um, to show th their take on you know, the traditional pieces. And I feel like that's in karaoke as well. You know, every time there's a Filipino party or a Filipino American party, um, everyone is, is, you know, someone will put a microphone in your hand and ask you to sing a well-known song because each of us adds our own thing to it. You know, whether it's musically better than someone else, that's not that's debatable, but there's an aspect of that personal identity, of that personal sense of expression that I feel like can be found in multiple genres. So when the Maguindanao, you know, um, encourage, you know, this person to you go play Binalig now, or you play Tidu, um, I see that. I see the parallels between the way that we use music in our social lives in the Philippines regardless of genre. And I think there's something there. I haven't fleshed it out, but I hope that um, someone, someone could um, take that um, and, and, and kind of and run with it and, and show, show it in different genres. So thank you so much for that question. Uh, yeah, I do, you know, wherever I am in the Philippines, whether it's Manila or, you know, Cotabato, it, it, some things on the surface might be different. You know, and some material things are different as well. But I, I just feel like, you know, that you know, that we're all Filipinos and that there are certain elements of, of you know, our interactions that transcend um, our different cultural groups. So thank you so much for that question. Anyway, uh, I would like to say that probably Filipino cultural identity can be summarized in three words. <laughs> Uh-huh. Flamboyance, <laughs> spirituality, and emotion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you agree with those. <laughs> I absolutely agree. Thank you so much, Dr. Santos. I think you're very right about that. Yeah. Is there a, another question, Dr. Silvestre? Yeah, Dr. Tan. Uh, Dr. Tan has a question. Arvin Tan. Uh, similar to the way the Filipino team maneuvered around the prohibition of displaying the Filipino flag at the 1998 Smithsonian Folk Festival, were there new ways or news account in which the PC band players contradicted the propagandistic aims of news media in their concerts? Uh, did Americans question the idea that their empire was able to train Filipino musicians in so short a time? So that's his question. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Tan, for that question. You know, there were some musicians, like I said, John Philip Sousa, um, you know, would, and others like him would have known that, you know, this is impossible that the American empire would train uh, Philippi uh, random Filipinos, as the newspapers said, in two short years. 
to not only play as a band, but also an orchestra mm -hmm. to be, even be able to play, um, you know, his pieces as well. So mm -hmm. did they push back against it? I, I don't have evidence of that per se, but I think that um, Colonel Loving in some ways did try to show um, that Filipinos were more than quote unquote little brown brothers. So he put forth soloists for mm. each concert and he um, would have the tuba solo, do a, uh, you know, concerto. Um, he would mm. have uh, the different instruments solo within the performance. And I think this wasn't just a musical choice. In my interpretation, I believe that he was trying to uh, <clears throat> Um, intervene <coughs> into the ways that um, the the newspapers characterized Filipinos as identical little brown men is what the newspapers said. So um, I, I think that was his way of you know an act of resistance. Um, and uh, and again, the Filipino band musicians sang. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, at a particular concert instead of playing. I think too, this was an act of resistance um, and transgression as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tan, for that question. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I was also thinking about that because you mentioned a lot of glowing reviews from the press, the American press in terms of uh, the playing of the PC mm -hmm. band, but I was also wondering about the non-glowing or the, 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 the negative uh, um, write-ups on that, particularly coming from the uh, anti-imperialist camp, the, the uh, Mark Twain and company. Uh, did you find any uh, that 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 described the, the kind of music making that they were making, aside from it, what you mentioned earlier? Right. Um, actually, no, uh, because the um, anti-imperialists by you know the 1904 fair were weakened at that point and didn't have such a strong voice. So I didn't find um, much evidence of them saying that, well, look here, the PC band is an example of why we shouldn't um, colonize the Philippines because uh, it was uh, already uh, colonized by that point. I did, however, see that there were a couple of editorials that said, well, look, this proves that we should have colonized the Philippines because they're so enthusiastic about being American and even more so than the average American. The average American didn't take his hat off, not all of them um, anymore to, during the playing of the national anthem. The Filipinos always stood up. Even when the national anthem was played during a play, the Filipinos stood up in the theater and newspapers commented on this. So to them, this would have meant something like Filipinos were enthusiastic about um, being um, colonial subjects. Um, but I think there's something more to it than that. Um, you know, this was something they were uh, ingrained to do. And, you know, perhaps um, uh, there, there's all kinds of ways to interpret it. But I, I think those are some examples of to answer your question. Thank uh, you, Mary. Dr. Mirano also uh, suggested something here. I took a screenshot for you, uh, Mary, so I can send it later in your email. I think this is going to be a, a very important uh, referencing case. Uh, so sorry to cut you off. Uh, we are, uh, uh, well, Dr. T uh, Mary still has an office hours after this. But there's a last really question. Oh, uh, so, oh, sorry, okay, go yeah, ahead. Uh, from Dr. Mirano, can we uh, have that? But we sure. try to make it brief. Yeah, uh, I, the question I think for all of us is, where do you find the subversion? Don't forget, we're a colonial, colonized nation. People could get killed. People could get sent back to the state to, to Manila in 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 in, in um, humiliation. Mm -hmm. You know, if you said something wrong, you have to do everything right. So. What are the chances of subversion and how do you do that? And that is the good question to ask. So when you're looking at your evidence, it might not be in the reports. It might not be in the documentation, but some, is, some of it is there. And I'd like to suggest that you read Gerard Glico about sanitation and architecture in the American uh, period around the same time because he he was able to find one or two instances of actual subversion, but it's not what you would think. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Morano. There, uh, in the book, I, I go into this a little bit more, but there were instances where not the PC band, but the Filipinos uh, at the 1904 and in other spaces would quietly play uh, the national anthem um, and um, kind of hide it within um, what they're playing. Uh, and, and maybe not during a concert, but it was banned at the time. And so they did play it. Um, I have evidence of that, that they would play it um, on their off days when they're not performing. And I feel like, you know, maybe it wasn't a subversion. It didn't subvert power, um, all of the power, but it was resistance. Um, there uh, is evidence too of um, the Bontoc group when the constabulary um, was trying to get them to be quiet, would play louder. Um, and uh, also, you know, the, the constabulary had, as you said, limited resistance, um, but they did at one point actually refuse to play and they refused to go to the 19, um, uh, 1915 Panama Pacific because uh, they didn't get paid enough. So maybe not subversion, but definitely resistance. And um, I think, yeah, the Smithsonian question is a, a bigger question that perhaps we can discuss at an, another time, but thank you so much for that. And um, please feel free to email me um, if I didn't get to your question or if there's something further um, that you'd like to ask me, um, you could email me at um, mtalusin at gmail.com. And you could follow me, Instruments of Empire, um, on Instagram. So you can DM me as well. I really had an excellent time seeing all of you today and discussing this with you. Thank you so much for coming to my presentation. I hope you'll invite me again in the future. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank by you. the way, uh, by the way, I already have your book. Ah, salamat po. Thank you, Dr. Santos. I wish I could see you again soon. Yeah, sure. I really miss being there. <laughs> Okay, where where are you, you staying now? Where are you staying now? I'm in uh, Los Angeles. Near oh, Los Cerritos. Angeles. Apa. Okay, yes, we, Los Angeles. Uh, we, I might go there one of these days, you know. Yes, please. I'll buy you dinner. Anything. Okay. <laughs> Call me. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have a certificate of appreciation from uh, uh, Nico. Please present your uh, the, uh, graduate students' appreciation in also the College of Music. Okay, Nico, just read it. We can send him the certificate that later. <laughs> All right. So I'll just read the text of the certification. Okay. Uh, okay. So the University of the Philippines College of Music awards this certification certificate of appreciation to Dr. Mary Talusan Lacanlale for sharing her expertise on research and critique during the master class of the graduate programs of the UP College of Music held on November 24, 2021. Signed, Laverne C. De La Pena, PhD, Dean of the College of Music, and Maria Christine Muiko, PhD, Coordinator of the Graduate Programs. Maraming salamat po, Dr. Lacanlale. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Have a Thank good you. day. Thank you, Mary. And hope to okay. see you again soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, one Good photo ball. session. Quick photo oh, session. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay, Jack, can you get per page? Thank you. <laughs> Ready? Okay, first page. Second page. Third page. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And again, we have uh, an upcoming international conference for graduate students, Salixit. You can visit the website of the UP College of Music, uh, and then you can check out uh, how to join our international conference. Again, uh, thank you so much. Uh, also, even the undergraduate students here, not just the graduate students are here also as well, and the professors and our international guests, even Titania, I, I see you here, one of the uh, Kulintang supporters. A lot of our U.S. guests are here. Maraming salamat and a good day to everyone.